for European experts who have adopted them on a larger scale than us and have published guidelines in the field of arrhythmia and heart failure. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Emma Svenamberg, who is the Chair, Digital Committee of European Heart Rhythm Association and who is faculty at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. I also warmly welcome Professor Martin Kovi, a highly accomplished cardiologist from Royal Brompton Hospital, London, where he leads heart failure unit. I'm told he's going to join us a few minutes later. And finally, it's my pleasure to have our own Dr. Deepak Padmanabhan, a brilliant young electrophysiologist and a faculty at the prestigious Jaydeva Institute, Bangalore, in this joint session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, join me welcoming the president of the European Heart Rhythm Association, Christophe Leclerc, for his opening remarks. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Lars. It's for me as a president of the European Heart Rhythm Association, it's a privilege and a great pleasure to uh, chair this session with your joint session with the uh, Indian Heart Rhythm Society and ERA. I know that your uh, scientific society is very active. And first, I have to congratulate you for the program. Uh, it's a tremendous program, and uh, this did show that your uh, society is very, very active. I think the collaboration between ERA and the Indian Health Rhythm Society is very important. As you know, in the past, when it was possible to travel, we organized uh, courses in India, and also we have very good collaboration uh, for scientific documents. So for me, it was very important to be with you online. Unfortunately, I, I would prefer to be in a mind day with you. But by the way, I think it's very important. And I would like to thank also uh, Emma, as you mentioned, Emma is the chair of the digital uh, committee in ERA, and she's very active and she's an expert in digital health. Thank you, Yulas. All right, so uh, uh, before we uh, start off, you know, let me again welcome Martin Kovi, uh, whom I just introduced. Welcome, Dr. Martin Kovi. Uh, so we are starting off with the, the first presentation from Dr. Emma Svenamberg. Uh, as I said, uh, she is the chair, Digital Committee of European Heart Rhythm Association, and is a faculty at the Kalonska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. She's going to be addressing us with her topic, Artificial Intelligence Enabled Atrial Fibrillation Diagnosis and Stroke Prevention. Uh, Dr. Emma, welcome. Dear colleagues, dear organizers, it is a great pleasure to be here today to talk to you at the Digital Indian HRS 2021. Indeed, it would have been preferable to be there in person, in particular, as it is minus 14 degrees Celsius here in Stockholm today, so quite chilly. But today I have the honor of discussing with you about artificial and intelligence enabled atrial fibrillation diagnosis and stroke prevention. My name is Emma Svenberg. I'm an electrophysiologist at the Karolinska University Hospital, Karolinska Institute at in Stockholm, Sweden. And today I hope through this talk and discussion that I can give you a clinical view on how we can use this, these novel methods in order to improve outcomes for our patients. Please note my disclosures. Well, novel methods, after all, artificial intelligence, it's not so new. Indeed, it was already in the 1950s that techniques that enabled computers to mimic human behaviors were invented, followed by a surge in the 1980s when machine learning, uh, that is just a subset of artificial intelligence techniques that enables computers to learn without explicit programming, made AI popular again. And now with deep learning, which is, is a subset of machine learning using multi-layers, indeed, there's been a new boom in artificial intelligence. The difference between machine learning and deep learning is simply that in machine learning, you'd have to do, use an expert to do a feature extraction. For example, identify things within the ECG that you think are of interest and feed that into your model. When it comes to deep learning, the model will do that by itself. 
But why do we use, why is there such a boom of artificial intelligence now? Well, the explanation is partly in this image showing that you needed indeed an aeroplane just to transport the computer you needed for your analysis in the 1950s. Whereas now, of course, uh, with new uh, hardware, we have indeed the computational power. We do also have vast data resources and the science has progressed with regards to algorithms making AI possible at the moment. So what are some of the advantages of a machine learning approach? Well, of course, we can feed in more complex inputs into machine learning, such as images. We can also take features of input data that can be difficult to see by the eye. For example, features of the ECG that you might not recognize, uh, but that the algorithm might. And indeed, you can also have input data that is more complex. So how can we use that then in clinical cardiology? Well, we might use it in order to identify atrial fibrillation early on. Could also possibly use it in treating our patients and also identifying those individuals at a risk of stroke. So we do of course know that patients with atrial fibrillation are at an increased risk of stroke and death, something that we can use oral anticoagulants to treat. But indeed, many patients have atrial fibrillation that they're not aware of due to the asymptomatic and commonly paroxysmal nature of the disease. And indeed, the question is, can we identify individuals with atrial fibrillation early in order to avoid stroke? Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, many have tried to predict who would get atrial fibrillation. And there's been a big question of how to identify the right population. And in the past, many AF risk scores have been developed using, for example, age and different clinical parameters, biomarkers, ECG markers, such as P waves, um, and also anatomical data, such as size of the left atrium. But indeed, looking at one of the most common prediction risk scores for atrial fibrillation, the charge AF score, we can indeed see that this can be a little bit complex to use in the clinical setting. Also, prediction with these risk scores is usually limited and they use a long follow up time. So in this risk score, for example, you can see that you can predict who would get atrial fibrillation within a five years time span. So it can be a little bit difficult to use in the clinical setting. Let's have a look if artificial intelligence can improve our prediction. In this large study using data from the UK, more, almost 3 million individuals were included, and of them approximately 3% developed new atrial fibrillation over the time course of 11 years. In this study, they used different models in order to identify the best model and compared them to regular risk scores. They came up with a solution of using a neural ne network and then actually used time varying factors in the model. So they did not just use baseline data, but could also take in newer uh, things that happened through to the patients during the follow up time. So the model was not a static model. Using this uh, machine, their machine learning model in order to five, find 75% of patients with atrial fibrillation, they had to screen 157,000 individuals as compared to a more regular model, such as the charge AF model uh, to predict incident atrial fibrillation. And you can see they had to screen substantially more individuals in order to detect the same amount of patients with atrial fibrillation. So the numbers needed to screen um, using the neural network model was nine as compared to 13 in the old, more old fashioned model. But overall, uh, this also used a long follow up time. So is there a way we can predict atrial fibrillation that is perhaps concomitant or, uh, or, uh, or coming sooner? And indeed in this landmark study um, by Professor Friedman's group published in the Lancet two years ago, they used a vast data set of regular 12 lead ECGs taken in their clinic, and they applied 
um, a neural network on them to identify, try to identify who would get atrial fibrillation within 31 days. And they did so, and they had a very high predictive ability to see who would get atrial fibrillation within 31 days. Of course, one wonders, can one combine these data together with the electronical healthcare records? And in this smaller study, they did so, and there was no actually difference between using uh, the charge AF uh, score as, combined, or as compared to the artificial ECG algorithm score. But if you combine the two, you actually got the best predictive model. Other large studies have recently shown similar data. In this study, using uh, ECGs from more than 400,000 American patients with a follow-up of four years in median, they could see that using just age and gender had not, a quite, not such a good predictive abilities. But if you use the ECG derived model, or indeed if you combined ECG with age and gender, you got the best predictive abilities of who would develop new onset atrial fibrillation within a year. This model worked well, regardless if the ECG was marked normal or abnormal in the notes. And also please note that they also tried to see who would get atrial fibrillation within 30 days and had a exactly similar actually predictive ability as the prior study that I showed you. So indeed, very much promise here in the ability to detect um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and also incident atrial fibrillation using ECG and electronic healthcare records. How about digital devices then? Because we don't only use ECGs nowadays, do we? We have all of these newer devices that use photoplethysmography. And indeed, this is data from such a study where they use data from the photoplethysmography and, and accelerometer in the Apple um, Watch. And in this study, they used the neural, neural network um, in order to see if they could diagnose atrial fibrillation based on PPG and accelerometer data. And indeed, in the validation in patients coming in for a cardioversion, they had really good predictive abilities of 0 0.97. However, using the data in a more ambulatory group of patients, they had a much lower C statistics. But in this study, in this second validation cohort, actually the patients self-stated if they had atrial fibrillation and it was not confirmed by ECG. How about the worry that digital devices will bring a lot of patients into our emergency rooms uh, with a lot of alerts? Well, this is a study where they looked at all of the patients who'd come into the emergency room uh, with an Apple Watch alert for abnormal pulse. Um, and this was a retrospective analysis. And in this study of 264 patients, we could see that there was actually only an actionable diagnosis um, in 11%. But please note that many patients are using this algorithm, even if they're not within the FDA approved group. Uh, in order to use the algorithm, according to FDA, you have to be above the age of 22 and you're not supposed to have no atrial fibrillation. How about in screening for atrial fibrillation? Well, this is data from three large screening studies performed in, two of them performed in Sweden, one in the UK, where individuals took a single lead ECG and that was used in order to predict who might get atrial fibrillation using intermittent recordings for two weeks. So very concomitant atrial fibrillation and indeed. And using um, this neural network algorithm, you can see that the predictive abilities were modest in this study. However, if we look at more um, at the age groups involved, both the stroke stop one and two study only included 75 and 76 year olds, whereas the safer study had a more diverse age population and the predictive abilities were actually quite a lot better in that group. So we will see for the future. 
But indeed, now we talked about early identification of AF. How about treatment? Can we use artificial intelligence to optimize treatment of patients with atrial fibrillation? In this very small study, um, yet interesting, individuals were randomized to an AI platform. Um, and in the platform, uh, there was an app who identified the patient, the medication, and confirmed uh, ingestion of oral anticoagulants. And by doing that, adherence increased substantially in the groups and kept uh, and remained high even at 12 weeks. In this study, one wanted to look at patients who had implantable cardiac devices and more than one day of atrial fibrillation and see if one could possibly use AF burden in these patients to predict who would get a stroke. They actually used three different machine learning methods and they could see that by using machine learning methods, actually the predictive abilities of the machine learning methods were better as compared to the chance mask score. So there is some promise in the future of using this to discern other features um, to better predict who would benefit from treatment. How about individuals at a risk of stroke then? In this study, individuals with a stroke of unknown origin, ESIS patients, 265 of them, they applied the 12 lead um, ECG algorithm as developed by Atia et al and could see that by using that, that they could predict quite nicely who would get atrial fibrillation in the future. But could we just use the ECG to predict who would get um, a stroke in the future? Well, this data set I showed you earlier, this is a very large data set that showed a good predictive ability from a 12 lead ECG to discern who would get um, atrial fibrillation. But they actually used their data set also to see who in their test set actually got a stroke. And of those who got a stroke, how many of them had a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation within a year after the stroke? So they had a look at how many of them had had an ECG prior to the stroke and then um, AF after the stroke, and they could identify 375 individuals at risk. And overall, they could predict quite nicely uh, who would get new atrial fibrillation and also who would get a new stroke. So. Um, this is quite an interesting new study. So overall, ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, we could use artificial intelligence um, to take data from the electronic healthcare records or from ECGs or from the combination of the two to predict future atrial fibrillation. We can also use single lead ECG devices in screening to predict future AF moderately well. We can use artificial intelligence to improve adherence and identify high-risk individuals in oral anticoagulant treatment. And indeed, we can now predict atrial fibrillation and also future risk of AF-related stroke by just using a single uh, a 12 lead ECG. Of course, there are some remaining issues. Integration of data. Uh, so combination of ECG biomarkers and electronic healthcare records, the explainability of our data, prospective trials, clinical validation and data safety. Thank you very much for your interest. Uh, thank you, Dr. Emma. It was a wonderful talk. Um, maybe we'll proceed to another talk and I hope you stay back with us. Maybe, you know, there will be a discussion on your topic uh, after all the speakers give their talks. Please, please stay back with us. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. It was a, a fantastic uh, talk, not, not only for the future, but for the present. Thank you very much. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome my co-chair, Professor Ulnas Pondurangi from Madras. 
Uh, Ulnas is a very expert, is, is very expert in the field of electrophysiology and also in the cardiac devices. And he has uh, built uh, the largest remote monitoring unit in India. And uh, we are very happy to welcome here to discuss about cybersecurity and remote monitoring for cardiac implantable devices. Thank you, Ulnas. Thank you. Hello everyone. Let us discuss now a relatively new device technology called remote programming and also the cybersecurity concerns regarding remote monitoring and remote programming. As I said, remote programming is a relatively new technology which is used in the device patient management. Uh, even though it was approved by the FDA in the year 2008, the adoption of that technology has been recently increasing. And now uh, it, is, it is, I think, thanks to the COVID pandemic uh, requiring to monitor our patients remotely, becoming more and more a necessity. Remote programming allows wireless reprogramming of the device patients with the secure two-way communication. It is similar to the remote EP support, what most of us are very familiar with. Indeed, um, uh, it was us uh, in the year 2019 brought this concept of remote EP and device support uh, in the country. Um, for example, remote EP uh, support is like an expert or an electrophysiologist, either from his office or from at home, can support another electrophysiologist or an engineer outside his environment remotely. This is what we have been very familiar with. Our remote programming also has the same ability, wherein a paramedic or, uh, uh, or a company person with the knowledge of handling the programmer can be away from the implanter or an electrophysiologist who is dealing with the care of the patient. Remotely, uh, the technologist connects to the specialist over the internet and the specialist can access the programmer on his laptop or even a mobile phone and what all the functions the gentleman here could perform with the aid of the programmer, uh, the electrophysiologist could do on his laptop. And these communications over the internet are considered to be uh, cybersecurity proof because the encryption and decryption is very secured. As compared to remote monitoring, remote programming has specific, um, specific uh, objectives and uh, the differences could be quoted this way. First of all, remote monitoring we all know and that has, it has been strongly recommended that every device patient, it is preferred that he's monitored remotely. Whereas the remote monitoring can monitor only the data remotely. It remote programming can interrogate the device and reprogram the parameters and remotely. So this is the basic difference the real-time device information is unavailable in the remote monitoring. A remote monitoring can give you the information of the data, whatever the time period you would like to, which you would have specifically mentioned. In the remote programming, however, it allows for real-time data analysis. Um, we launched the remote device programming in the year 2021. Um, this video might help in understanding what is remote programming better. For example, a technologist is away from your office, maybe inside the hospital away from your room, or the person could be outside the specialist station. And here, the programmer is connected to the laptop of the physician. And he could actually not only program the device, 
but can do certain tests like threshold tests and they can measure all the parameters, whatever the, the, the programmer is able to perform. Remote programming can also help device implantation. For example, this video is going to demonstrate how a remote programmer can help an implant. For example, what's going on now, here is a conduction system facing implant, as you notice here. Um, and then imagine, imagine the, the person who is knowledgeable in handling the, in handling the device programmer, For example, the, the, the team here is supported by a device specialist outside the unit. And let's assume that the person, the, the person who he is, is outside the station. And then who has the control on the programmer? And the person now, with the aid of, say, iPad, could actually perform the device testing. All right. So the scope of the remote programming includes remote support of the device implants. And as I said, all the functions of the standard programmer. However, from the point of view of the security of the patient, FDA recommends not to perform the following functions, cardioversion, EP studies, or arrhythmia inductions, or underlying rhythm tests. Remote monitoring and programming, we now understand that they're essential for optimal patient management. However, increasing dependency on technology calls for caution because as long as these data are transferred wirelessly over the internet, it is susceptible to hacking. So the cybersecurity indeed is a concern. There are certain potential scenarios where the data can be hacked and the cyber attack is possible at various levels. At the programmer, an unauthorized person can access the programmer. A telemetry van, the wireless interrogations can be intruded. The, the implanted device itself can be hacked as long as it is connected by the Bluetooth. And we know that the remote monitoring is a scope where the extraction of the device extraction of the device data is possible remotely. Indeed, the cybersecurity and hacking of the data of the device and remotely programming as a cybersecurity has been the basis of the theme of one of the popular TV series called Homeland, wherein an intelligent computer wizard had been coaxed to, to infiltrate digitally the device data of a president where the intention is to harm his life. For example, here in this video, it is very clear how this could be possible. For example, the gentleman here has intruded into the device data of the president. He's trying now to see whether he can do EP testing in the form of induction. Well, as long as we consider there is a security threat, the industry have come out with time to time some updates. Whenever they have realized a particular area is sensitive and it could be hacked, they come out with the software updates. And um, so far, cyber attack leading to the patient harm is considered real. It has never been actually documented, thankfully. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Panduradi, for this very exciting talk, and especially the remote programming, which is not uh, very used in, uh, in many countries. We use remote monitoring, but not remote programming. But I think that we will have uh, and the discussion, uh, you, you will share your experience about that. So thank you very much. It was a 
fantastic talk. Thank you. Right. So, you know, after that um, brief talk on the cybersecurity issues, now we come to again the basic theme of this program, and that is the artificial intelligence enabled um, uh, the, the healthcare, especially with arrhythmia and heart failure. Now, it's my pleasure to invite my friend, Dr. Deepak Padmanabhan, uh, who is the faculty at the prestigious Jadeva Institute, Bangalore, who would be talking about artificial intelligence inhaled, uh, enabled diagnostics, which would help predict sudden cardiac death and how does it help. So may I welcome Dr. Deepak Padmanabhan. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank the Indian Heart of Them Society for this opportunity to present at this unique joint session with the European Heart of Them Association. I shall be speaking about the role of artificial intelligence in the diagnosis management of sudden cardiac arrest. The objectives of my talk are essentially to discuss the scope of the problem, the challenges before us, and how artificial intelligence may aid in recognition, prevention, and optimization of resources to the management of sudden cardiac arrest. Implementation of the real world management of these conditions will also be discussed in brief. In a questionnaire which was completed by medical trainees from eight medical colleges, comprising of nearly around 22,724 people being evaluated, Nearly 10.3% deaths were adjudicated as sudden cardiac deaths. The age profile of these patients were five to eight years younger compared to the Western Hemisphere. Among 254 patients admitted as cardiac arrest to CMC Vellor, 73% of them had in additional in-hospital cardiac arrests. Most of them were pulseless electrical activity and survival to hospital admission was 30%, where survival to discharge was just 10%. In the out-hospital cardiac arrests, 7.4% only received bystander resuscitation. As we all know, the proportion of people with comorbidities having sudden cardiac arrest is large. However, in terms of absolute numbers, it's the general population who's at maximal risk. The reasons for poor survival amongst others include an inadequate initial response by people around this patient, the heightened response times of medical personnel, and as we grow older, the increasing number of comorbidities that we have. One of the easiest ways to prevent sudden cardiac arrest is to be able to preempt it, and the evaluation or assessment of ejection fraction remains a very powerful tool in the same. The use of machine learning algorithms to be able to predict the ejection fraction of a patient from a 12 lead ECG is one of those algorithms that can help us diagnose patients at risk of a sudden cardiac arrest. Additionally, this algorithm also predicts a future decline in ejection fraction if the current echocardiographic value is normal. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can also be detected using a convolutional neural network via the use of a 12 lead ECG. It was possible to diagnose HCM with a positive predict, with a negative predictive value of 99%. So ECGs could be ruled out as having HCM or not. Apparently normal looking ECGs would also be diagnosed correctly using this algorithm and the probability of having an abnormal ECG after myectomy showed an appropriate decline. Review of data sets to be able to diagnose ICD therapy and abnormal heart rhythms is also possible in these patients, as is the automated extraction using natural language processing of factors that put a patient at higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest in HCM. 
using home based speakers or smartphones it was possible to diagnose agonal breathing and other sounds which were secondary to patients having a sudden cardiac arrest and over various iterations the false positive rate became virtually non existent this was evaluated over a variety of vendors and in both males and females this provides a very powerful tool to be able to diagnose sudden cardiac arrests and contact somebody either medical personnel or family people around diagnosis of an abnormal qt interval is also very useful in predicting arrhythmias and a machine learning algorithm was able to correlate very well with the diagnosis of abnormal qt intervals as compared to an experienced cardiologist in addition the algorithm was also able to diagnose a chanelopathy based long qt syndrome even when the ecg was apparently normal a coming from diagnosing patients at risk to the use of ai in ensuring adequate allocation of resources in this study performed using the fireman's database in japan it was possible by a machine learning algorithm to predict whether a particular area would have a spike in cases of sudden cardiac arrest based on meteorological variables so it, availability of similar algorithms for various geographical locations could help in better allocation of limited resources similarly on the emergency call numbers ml algorithms did well in being able to diagnose whether the distress calls were for patients having outside hospital cardiac arrest or not the algorithm was able to do better than the human dispatcher who was receiving the call but the under reliance of the human dispatcher on the same prevented the algorithm from showing significant clinical benefits this is now being evaluated in a more formal manner in the assist protocol in uk for patients within the hospital too evaluation and assessment of various vitals and other variables can help create machine learning models to identify patients who are at risk of sudden cardiac arrest as well as predict the neurological outcome for patients who are having sudden cardiac arrest in an outside hospital setting track and trigger systems which have been traditionally used to diagnose patients at risk of sudden cardiac arrest using single vitals or multiple vitals have now been enhanced by the use of machine learning algorithms to be able to provide similar or even better results at lower alarms per patient per hour presumably this is because of a better understanding of the interrelation between the various vitals that comprise the trigger and track systems addition of learning features within these algorithms stand to make these even more powerful thereby improving the efficacy of the system as a whole in identifying patients and setting off alarms for patients at risk assessment of the 12 lead ecg can also predict cardiac arrest in hospitalized patients in this study by quan et al this algorithm could predict sudden cardiac arrest within 24 hours of the ecg being taken so these are again important algorithms which could help shape practice to aid in allocation of resources and intervene ahead of time in patients who are at higher risk thereby providing them with a higher grade of care or more nursing care in order to enable appropriate interventions the crt 
and the defibrillator components of the device have been through time very useful in improving outcomes. Now with the use of machine learning algorithms, we can go beyond the LBBB and the QRS duration greater than 150 milliseconds in identifying those patients using QRS waveforms run, run through a machine learning algorithm to look at outcomes of CRD implantation. This risk calculator is available at this link and could prove useful to identify patients who could do well with the use of CRT. In patients who had ischemic cardiomyopathy and ejection fraction less than 40%, evaluation of the action potential or monophasic action potential using the Boston Scientific MAP catheter and following them up over a period of time was able to figure out certain action potential phenotypes that were at higher risk for developing cardiac arrest. This, when evaluated in a larger cohort, could prove very useful in identifying patients at a higher risk of cardiac arrest in times to come. As with every literature that is available to us, assessment of the validity of the same is important. We have to evaluate the model performance whether certain subgroups where we are planning to apply it onto are indeed evaluated and the models have to be validated across external populations. Updation of the model is critical and use of these models without appropriate safety nets may prove to be challenging. Oversight on AI from regulatory bodies as well as from insurance companies is very important. In the future, we hope to integrate multiple modalities like imaging, ECGs, echoes in order to aid in improvement in prediction as well as tailor a procedure if needed to the anatomy and the physiology of the patient. In India, the National Digital Health Blueprint, in Singapore, Apple and uh, the Singapore government, the National Digital Health Mission, as well as South Korean's clearance to the VUNO algorithm for cardiac arrest prevention are all steps in the forward direction to help prevent sudden cardiac arrest and better manage these patients. The Safe Heart M Health platform is attempting to aid with the use of ML algorithms, our prediction of patients who would be good candidates for sudden cardiac arrest. The results of this are awaited. Improvement in the hardware used to record something as simple as an ECG can help provide data which can then be processed using AL, AI and ML algorithms to give you a virtual bouquet of possibilities for a single ECG. Trust in AI, however, remains challenging and it's a work in progress. The mind is a high resistance pathway and just logic may not help us change our behavior. Hence, it is important to incorporate other incentives, mainly social incentives, by making our activities witnessable and thereby allowing us to model our behaviors on others. In the meanwhile, given our infrastructure, it is important that we rely upon the one thing that is definitely known to improve outcomes, namely bystander CPR, and allocate and concentrate our resources in ensuring that a large population knows about CPR and is capable enough to provide it. Increasing penetration of defibrillators, automated external ones at that, and teaching pe people how to use them is very crucial in ensuring a potential herd immunity situation. In summary, therefore, sudden cardiac arrest is a challenge of immune, immense magnitude. AI can aid in the early detection of at-risk group as well as early detection of the condition. It's important that we allocate our resources wisely and AI can help in it. It's important that we are able to predict in-hospital cardiac arrest so as to treat our patients better. Acceptability remains still a challenge and bystander CPR still remains a very viable and important intervention in the management of these patients. Thank you for your patient hearing. I would love to take some questions.
Um, well, uh, Deepak, thank you so very, very much. Uh, it's my pleasure now to invite uh, Professor Martin Covey, a highly accomplished cardiologist from Royal Brompton Hospital, London, where he leads the heart failure unit. And uh, we have been hearing his talks in various forums. And now he specifically is going to address the artificial intelligence enhanced heart failure diagnostics and management. Martin, it's my pleasure to invite you to this joint session of European Heart to Them Association with Indian Heart to Them Society. Welcome. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to speak about AI-enabled heart failure diagnosis and management at this joint session between ERA and the Indian Heart Rhythm Society. My name is Martin Cowie and I'm Professor of Cardiology at the Brompton Hospital in King's College, London. My major declaration of interest is that I chair the ESC Digital Health Committee, so have been deeply involved in this area for some years. So will artificial intelligence come to our rescue and help us face some of the major challenges we have in heart failure diagnosis and management? And you're all very aware of the fact that the amount of data that we potentially have and can use has increased dramatically in recent years. We talk about big data and the four Vs of volume, but also velocity, particularly when you have wearables where you can have very fast changing data and from multiple sources and variety, of course, is key to all of this. The last V I'm not going to talk about, and that's veracity of some of the data that could be potentially used. But one of the key facts is that 90% of the world's data has been created in the past two years. So it's a very steep slope, lots of potential, but how do we create value from this? And it's quite clear that the human mind itself cannot manage such speed and volumes of data that could be potentially available. Although the slight caveat to this, sometimes it's just one piece of information that's missing rather than needing the need for access to thousands of bits of information. And I think it's very good to remind ourselves in this discussion about what we try to achieve as cardiologists. And it is about diagnosis, which is quite often a yes or no phenomenon, also about risk prediction and prognosis and treatment decisions, should you or should you not offer a particular drug or a particular intervention. The monitoring equation, of course, is opened up immensely in heart failure in recent times, but that is quite a difficult journey, and I'll share some of the key points in that during this talk. But ultimately, a lot of what we do as doctors is about persuading, about influencing, about helping individuals make the right decision for them. Those things are unlikely to be replaced by artificial intelligence. But some of the key components of diagnosis, restratification, and monitoring may very well be supported by a variety of machine learning approaches with perhaps some human supervision at some level. If you only read one paper about artificial intelligence and cardiology, please look at this paper in our new journal, European Heart Journal, Digital Health, which is looking very much at the different applications here. And heart failure is a small component. A lot of it is about rhythm disorders, ECG interpretation and imaging interpretation. Increasing low electronic health record data can be incorporated into these uh, data analytical approaches. And what we do see, of course, is there's not a lot of transparency. Very few studies are registered. We don't know what hypotheses they set out with, how they changed over time, and availability to look at the data sets or use the algorithms in your own data is very limited at the present time. But we do know what should happen. You have these multiple sources of data, which can be clinical, can be biological and all of the omics, but also increasingly potentially wearables, environmental data, um, and putting them all together in a way that's carefully curated and labeled. And then a variety of different machine learning approaches can be applied and often blended together to end up with a model that might help predict the probability of certain events happening or whether diagnosis is likely or not. The important part on the right-hand side of this slide is the validation of this. This is just like any other statistical modeling process. It will be overfitted 
to just one data set. You have to see how it performs in other data sets before you would expect it to be implemented to wide scale. So these are the challenges of moving forward in this field. But already there's lots of devices and I don't want to advertise one specific product, but you can see in this latest paper in Jack, that there are a lot of devices already available in the marketplace that have machine learning embedded within them in terms of ECG or image interpretation. So AI is not the future, AI is here already. Let me just give you some quick examples of heart failure though to the subject of this talk. So this is a paper that's just available online in Lancet Digital Health. And this is where Carolyn Lamb and collaborators have looked at machine learning uh, workflows to interpret echocardiograms. And they've developed the deep learning and then applied it in several different data sets to see how well it can actually measure things like ejection fraction and various different measures of diastolic uh, dysfunction. And in cutting a long story short, it shows that ejection fraction is still a rather variable feast, but this algorithm is just as good as humans at measuring and remeasuring ejection fraction. And for things that are slightly more precise, such as E prime or E, e prime ratio, then um, a much better. Looking to the right hand side, you can see the areas under the curve in these different data sets for identifying obvious HEFREF or obvious diastolic abnormalities is actually very good and probably as good as humans. And with a human check on things could very much speed up the process of image interpretation. So there's a very recent paper where echocardiography can be looked at by an algorithm and coming up with very good readings from the data from that, as good as seasoned operators, which may make interpretation more generally available with this limited resource. Here's another study just published in European Heart Journal Digital Health. And this is looking at trying to identify HEFPEF, which can be a challenging diagnosis to make. It's a study that's come from South Korea, it uses a deep learning uh, methodology and using the digital ECG, so extracting information from all of the ECG, and just four basic clinical features, the age of the patient, the sex, the height, and the weight. And they looked at the thousands and thousands of ECGs from one hospital system with 4,000 of those patients having HEFPEF carefully diagnosed. And then once they developed their algorithm, they then looked at it in another hospital system with 1,700 patients with HEFPEF and 12,000 ECGs. So an attempt to validate externally, albeit still in just a South Korean population. These are the approaches that I've done. This is a deep learning, so there's more than three layers to this, and then blending it also with the very basic uh, characteristics. So you could imagine this approach being used, patient even in the waiting room, the four basic characteristics already known, the digital ECG is taken, the algorithm works, and then it delivers to you very high, uh, very accurate estimation of the chance of it being HEFPEF or not. You can see even in the externally validated um, deep learning uh, algorithm, the negative predictive value is 96%. So you could be very sure that HEFPEF was very unlikely using this algorithm, which might then make the consultation shorter, might even say that you don't even need to do an echocardiogram. Lots of potential here to improve the workflows, particularly when there's so many patients and limited resources such as echocardiography, but just pointing to the future where these algorithms might be very useful to extract the maximum value from the data that's easily available and therefore um, helping with the efficiency of uh, healthcare, faster time to accurate diagnosis, faster time on to treatment. But what finally about monitoring and heart failure? And there's been an enormous activity in this area with implantable technologies and also an increasing array of wearables. And so you could in effect have a digital fingerprint taken off your patient every single hour of every single day and for every single patient. This would give you a tsunami of data. So obviously you're going to need some processes to go through this and identify the signal from the noise.
It's not just about the sensor. Lots of clever engineers, as you know, that can design these and the data can be transmitted. It's about the data flows, extracting the signal from the noise and then making it actionable so you know what to do in response to this. And ultimately, if the patient won't change what they do or change their medications or accept some different approach, then the whole system falls down. So it's about blending of human factors as well as data collection and data sense making in this equation. And it's moving very much from risk prediction, which is not so difficult to do even with a few variables, to risk reduction. So that actionable uh, interpretation of the data and then things that you can do to reduce the risk. I've done lots of studies in this space. Perhaps we can discuss it in the question time. But some of the studies, this is .HF, a randomized trial. We looked at one implantable parameter, which is optival transthoracic impedance. And we actually increased heart failure hospitalizations by 80% by the way we'd set up the study. So there was an alarm that went off, an audible alarm that uh, made the patient anxious anxious, the family anxious, the doctors anxious, lots of extra heart failure admissions, but actually it wasn't heart failure decompensation. Nobody died during these admissions and they were short. So once again, hopefully making the point, it's not just about data and clever algorithms and about risk. It's about how you act on these and the human factors in this equation. And this is perhaps why with a lack of consistency in different studies, with different interventions, different populations, different systems of looking at data, the guidelines, even the most recent ESC guidelines and heart failure are very lukewarm about this saying may be considered to do home telemonitoring. So it might be appropriate for some patients. And even for implantables, the only recommendation is for cardiomems, implantable pulmonary artery pressure monitoring, because it at least has a randomized trial that was very positive and lots of real world evidence behind it. But you can see that so far, it hasn't really persuaded the guideline writers in a way. COVID, of course, has changed this, where the need for social distancing and isolation is very important. So perhaps just being able to deliver the same outcomes using remote technologies may actually be a good result um, and give you some more tools to use. But I think just in conclusion, the direction of travel is obvious. And the patient living with often many chronic conditions. How can we use digital technology? How can we collect information remotely? How can we make sense of that? And ultimately, hopefully, the patient themselves uses the technology to maintain stability. And we only pull in the expensive and slow healthcare system when that doesn't work. This is the view and machine learning will definitely be part of the equation, but not the only solution. There are some downsides, of course, which often get media attention, that it's only as good as the data set it's trained on. It needs to be validated very robustly. Otherwise, you just bake in the biases of your data set in the first place. People worry about the lack of understanding about how it's processing information, but sometimes I think that argument is overdone. I think some degree of human checks on things is important if there's a risk, if the decision is wrong. And there's also, of course, in different societies, concern about data privacy and also uh, liability issues for a physician. If they make a decision with a patient and it doesn't work out well, then where does the legal liability lie? So there's lots of regulatory and professional issues to sort through together as we co-design the future. Just finishing now, um, here is the Futurist Institute leader, Bertalan Mesco, from a uh, a blog he did earlier this year. And what he said is that automation won't replace physicians, it will still be needed, but those using automation will replace those that don't. So I think that's very important. This is a tool where it shows value, we should use it. And if you don't use some of these approaches, you definitely will not be able to offer modern practice to your patients. At the European Society of Cardiology, we're very active in this space. Please watch out for our different activities. We also have our own journal, European Heart Journal Digital Health, and we have a digital summit uh, each year and a lot of activities to increase digital literacy, but also the co-design and co-implementation of many of these different approaches. So the future is not something that we passively move towards. The future is something that we can create 
uh, with co-design and co-implementation, let's create a better future and machine learning and AI will be part of that, but not the only solution. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Martin Corey. Uh, that was uh, quite an enlightening lecture. I think uh, you convincingly spoke about how the artificial intelligence enabled diagnostics help us detect our heart failure patients at an early stage and how it can enable to tailor the therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, please stay back. Um, we are going to have the discussion on all the topics which we covered. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, um, this is my pleasure, uh, my honor uh, to invite uh, the patron of Indian Heart Rhythm Society, Professor Khalilullah, who I am not going to be considered wrong if I introduce him as the person who is a pioneer and who brought the concept of cardiac electrophysiology in the country. And I share a special bond with him. It is him who encouraged me all throughout. And you know, it's such a pleasure to have him on the screen here. So I'm going to be inviting him to start off the discussion. It would take about 10 minutes we have. And followed by the discussions, may I request Professor Khalilullah to also give some concluding remarks. Uh, sir, um, may I invite you to take over? Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for this uh, generosity and great honor. Uh, first of all, let me welcome all our friends from in the country and abroad who have taken the time to participate in this joint session. We have the session now open for discussion. And to read the first question, let me have the privilege that uh, till all these uh, sophisticated equipments available for, uh, uh, for us and in India, as well as the various cardiologists the world over, are there some simpler devices which can help in prediction of cardiac arrhythmias and other conditions? Uh, I keep learning and hearing about this uh, uh, smart watches. What is this about? Can you throw some light on that? And our friends, it's very simple as I think it's a very, very simple question, but let me inquire as to what is the rule of these things, which are small toys. Professor Emma, um, you may take over. Yes, well, thank you very much. And that's a very interesting question, Professor Kalilula. Thank you for pointing that out. Indeed, uh, smartwatches are very becoming more and more abundant in our societies. And three major recent studies have looked at smartwatches uh, in the detection of atrial fibrillation. So uh, that was the Apple Heart study, the Huawei study, and more recently, the Fitbit uh, study presented recently in the US. These watches mainly use uh, photoplethysmography, so PPG, uh, which is a simplified sensor just mainly detecting blood flow um, and pulse uh, wave differences in patients. We can see that PPG is now actually quite good at discerning atrial fibrillation. So what they've looked at in this study is, is not the sensitivity, so not the ability really to find atrial fibrillation, but once you have a regular um, heart rhythm detected by these devices, that it is quite specific for atrial fibrillation. So I think in the future, PPG uh, might move to become diagnostic of atrial fibrillation, but in the current guidelines from the ESC, uh, ECG is still required for diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, but it certainly has great promise. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, another question to Deepak uh, Padmarabhan. The software they had developed, uh, can that be shared uh, or uh, we can uh, join join uh, various institutions together to have a multi-central study in the country. Uh, Deepak Padunaban. Thank you for your question, sir. Definitely, it's one of my passions to be able to bring that uh, to our country. These are essentially algorithms that are based on clouds. And so long as we are able to figure out how the data sharing goes apart and the data storage within the country is maintained, I have no doubt in my mind that these algorithms can be validated for our population. And in addition to that, separate algorithms taking into account 
what our population's myriad possibilities are, as well as the unique features of our population are, we can create our own, as well as add in features to the bigger algorithm. I have no doubt in my mind that these can be done. In fact, we are in the process of uh, figuring out the logistics for the same, and would imagine eventually us and the uh, major cardiology societies in cohort with the government and local bodies being able to provide this on a much larger scale. But for all of that, we would require for um, national and international collaboration to pull together sure. in the same direction. Wonderful, wonderful. That's great. I think that's the future for the science, you know, and uh, we have to pull our resources together to have some meaningful data from these studies. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, it was a uh, uh, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Very clear and lucid uh, talk. My question is to Professor Martin Ko. Uh, uh, regarding the heart failure, as you rightly said, sir, the, uh, the digital, digital health mission is the future of uh, health management. But uh, making it easier and uh, approachable to our common patients, what steps should we take? to ensure that uh, they come to us earlier. We can, apart from making diagnostic uh, tests when they come to the hospital, apart from getting collected from the treating, treating physicians and uh, other resources, what else can we do to have a large database and uh, have people to come earlier, earlier for treatment of heart failure? Professor Martin Ko, please, can you help me? It's a great question. Thank you very much. So I, I think really upstream trying to prevent heart failure, I think a lot of digital tools are very helpful. So for example, blood pressure control, even just smartphones or not even smartphones, just mobile phones can help support patients more interested in their blood pressure. The devices to measure blood pressure now are getting simpler and simpler. And we've got trials to show that if you empower the patients, inform them, these technologies can support better control, better outcomes. But I think the key thing is it's not about shiny new toys that are expensive and from high tech companies and wealthy countries and shy, showing these, uh, throwing these toys at people. It's about co-design with patients. What's the problem? What could be helped by these technologies? How can we co-create and co-implement? So I think the whole field is becoming more mature, uh, more nuanced, and actually working together to design solutions that really work that people will use. So it's an exciting time, but lots of mistakes have been made. Hopefully we can learn from that and move forward together. Wonderful. Thank you. Finally, I have a question for our distinguished Ulas Padurangi, he said about remote monitoring. Uh, regarding remote monitoring, one appreciates the uh, approachability, accessibility of a large number of patients who are from time to time monitoring the data from pacemaker or implantable electrical devices. But regarding the, uh, the, the programming, uh, remote programming, would that be a dangerous trend for some people or uh, is that ethically allowed as yet? I do not know. Uh, Ulas, can you throw some light on that? Well, uh, as uh, the concern was raised, and in fact, that was the topic of the discussion, um, I do not think we should shy away from the technology, remote programming, just because there are certain concerns. Uh, we can address those concerns when uh, the, the handling of the programmer is secured. As long as that becomes the responsibility of the institution or a hospital or the physician who is involved in this uh, remote programming, I do not think there is a third party encroachment on the programming. At any stage, even if there's a technical glitch, the, the, the person who is with the programmer by the side of the patient can right. disconnect the connection. Yeah. And it is just not possible from a third agent to involve into the programmer. I think, sir, uh, it is quite secured. Uh, instead of looking at the security issues, what we should be looking at, how good this technology is, especially for a country like us. 
what that is required presently is a programmer at a place where even a device uh, company representative may not have to go. Any paramedical person who can handle that programmer takes it to the by the side of the patient and keeps the mm -hmm. wand on it. That's all right. over, sir. He has to right. have an internet connection. Right. Yeah, it is absolutely great. You know, for example, in our own hospital, now we do not, the physician doesn't have to be by the side of the patient. It is just one of the ward boys or one of the ECG technician is by the side. And you can actually visualize the programmer screen. Sir, I think this technology is great. It is especially Sorry. applicable to us. And oh. now I understand that the programmer is not actually required. Right. The programmer, whole thing, what the programmer does could be incorporated into a smartphone, sir. Wonderful. So that's all that is. That smartphone is by the side of the patient. And that that's smartphone great. gets connected with the operator. And on his screen, mm -hmm. uh, the programmer screen is seen, sir. Wonderful. That's great. That's great. Uh, uh, historically, uh, well, last let me tell you that the association between uh, us and India and our European friends, uh, I can recall, is from 1986 when we at the GB Pant Hospital started surgery of cardiac arrhythmias. And Dr. Professor uh, Graham Bennett from Brom Brom Hospital, London, and Dr. Olaf Penn from Holland had come to join us for a week each to perform surgery of full Parkinson White syndrome. And this association between two societies has grown stronger and stronger. And today's meeting is to the highlight of this association. Today's session was in fact an eye opener when artificial intelligence has been introduced in the management of cardiac arrhythmias and prevention and treatment of heart failure. In fact, I think it's time to come. It is the science of future and digital health is going to be the subject of matter in the in times to come. Uh, our society, Indian Heart and Society, will have to have many tutorials and workshops to train and make us learn as to how to handle artificial intelligence and its application. It's amazing to see how from concept to application, in, uh, artificial intelligence will travel a very long distance. I'm sure it's going to be, going to, to be a great future for artificial intelligence and going to modify the management of cardiac arrhythmia as a heart failure. I must thank once again all our distinguished participants from other, our country, Ulas Pandurangi, Dr. Deepak Padmanabhan, and our friends abroad, and Christopher, the president of European Heart Rhythm Association, who has been very generous his time and kind enough to participate early in the morning this session. I thank you all once again, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Khalilullah, sir. And um, ladies and gentlemen, um, now it is the end of this Indian Heart Rhythm Society, European Heart Rhythm Association joint session. Even though the session is ending, I think as Professor Khalilullah said, it is the beginning of the great learning with our friends from the European Heart Rhythm Association. And this collaboration would continue. Uh, again, on behalf of Indian Heart Rhythm Society, Professor Leclerc, uh, Dr. Emma, Professor Kovi, thank you very, very much. You represented the European Heart Rhythm Association in a great fashion. Thank you so very much. And Deepak, our own friend, thank you very much. So we say bye, and then we'll, uh, we'll join the further sessions of IHRS 2021. Thank you. Thank you, thank you thank for you the invitation. So thank you. We appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.